Chicago, Chicago, I'll show you around. Speak of Chicago. The corner was our magic, our music, our politics. Fires raised as tribal dancers and war cries broke out of different quarters. Power to the people. Maybe we could start again. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is Casabez Makuma. And Jezerita de Basso. Coming again with episode three of the Chicago Sunnyside podcast. We have a visitor. Cat? Yeah, cats aren't even <laughs> supposed to be up here. Come here, kitty. We have a great show lined up for you today. We have Baba Sunjada. Uh, the principal of Betty Shabazz International Charter School, which is an Afri- African-centered K through 12. Matter of fact, they have preschool through 12, not 12, eighth grade. I didn't know they had a preschool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's new to me. Mm-hmm. We just celebrated Marcus Garvey's birthday. Marcus Garvey, as you guys know, one of our premier kind of revolutionaries yeah legendary revolutionary spirit who gave us gave many people millions of black people around the world the inspiration to want to go back to the continent of our origins and reclaim that as our home it's a great message and this is what we're still working what we're still building towards so going home doesn't mean that we have to be there all the time but going home means that we have to be there within ourselves, no matter where we are. Mm-hmm. Yes, going home looks different for everyone. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one thing that we hope that people are able to take away from what we're doing. Like some people get involved in what we're doing and they want to immerse themselves to the point of saying, you know what, I'm going to move there. Other people that's can take, me, by the way. <laughs> take our classes, lectures, workshops, even just this podcast is something that feeds the spirit. Mm-hmm. And we hope that you can find value from that. So going home can look different for every person. So get yourself involved in any way that that fits you. As we say here at the Sunnyside Podcast and at the Earth Center in general, the sun never sets. It's man who moves away from the light, and it's light that we're looking for. It's light that we have to find and get back to and hold on. Even if even if we have to be in darkness and we have to find the stars to light our way or light a torch, but it's light that we need to find our way forward, and when there's a time of confusion, we need to find the light to show us the way. Absolutely. So that light, we hope that you can find that light within the, this work that we're doing and you can share your light with us. This is a two-way street. We're not trying to pretend that we are the only ones and have all the light and all the answers. That's the, the challenge of what we're doing. We want to network with people who have some light and want to share their light. We have some light and want to share our light and we can just continue to build together. On that, on that note, I'll uh, direct you to look at our uh, comment section. I mean, not the comment section, but, but the details section in this video where you can find the link to get in touch with us and share some feedback, share a question, share an idea, share whatever, whatever you want to share with us. Whatever speaks to you to share with us, connect with us, or what have you, you can connect with us, and we look forward to hearing from you. And uh, while you're at it, hit that like button and subscribe and do the little bell thingy for notifications and share it with Fran. Today we're going to be talking about education. Again, we're very excited to be talking to Baba Sunjata from Betty Shabazz Charter School. Before we get into that, just on the note of education, education being really that light that we're talking about, Mm -hmm. education, knowledge, wisdom, guidance is what we need to light our path forward. And well, before we had the modern schools, before we had kindergarten and high school and in college and blah, 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 blah. We still had education in Africa and indigenous cultures around the world all had their education systems. And that's what we call initiation. And initiation really will be the education into life itself. The education and how to function as a human being amongst other people and within yourself. What gives us our sense of identity, what gives us our sense of belonging, 
will give us a sense of purpose and uh, give us the kind of like the more roadmap or even like the the warning the little thing where you see the instructions with the little warning on it slippery when wet signs and all this type of stuff that we need for our life because we have our slippery times in life we have our uh, hazardous times in life mm-hmm. absolutely and it's interesting because in in traditional culture initiation starts at a very early age mm-hmm. by the time you're seven years old you're on your way to initiation camps however we miss that here in the west we have certain processes called like rites of passage but we send our children off to preschool at four we go to kindergarten at five and then right off to what first grade first grade, grade or whatever that. that is and and you never get this notion of initiation and that's where it's like you're really learning what life is and how you're supposed to fit into it and it's like your family is the one that's like initiating you into life or should be and if you miss that component then we end up with a lot of challenges that we could have avoided had we learned some of those life skills mm-hmm. And that's that's the same way our communities have been burning all this time. Mm -hmm. America has been the world's premier marketplace since the transatlantic slave trade generated the most free wealth the world has ever seen. People from all over the globe have been traveling to America to make money to send back home, while those born on American soil are being seen around the world as misinformed or even cultureless. The identity crisis facing Americans is apparent as our population struggles to cope with life through various forms of distractions and self-medication. These are all symptoms of the real problem, which is a lack of culture and values. Since the dawn of civilization, knowledge to guide the human being through the experience of life has been developed and passed down through initiatic education. The Dogon temples of West Africa that have preserved the world's oldest mystery school education have brought their secret society initiations to Chicago. The Umtam temples of the Kebta offer education in language, history, natural and spiritual principles, and healing. Call 773-359-4160 for more information, or follow the link to pre-register for classes. That being said, we wanted to talk about a couple of things. First of all, these this wildfire that happened in Hawaii, they're still counting the dead. They're well up over 100 dead, but I think over 1,000 missing, which is like if they're still missing and it's 1,000 of them, you almost can be like... I mean, I saw I saw one of the police, the police chief or something from the town saying like, we can't, we our 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 staff is not equipped to go through smoldering wreckage mm-hmm. safely, and it makes sense in a sense, but at the same time, it's just awful because if there's someone who may be still alive, like, mm-hmm. what are you going to do for those people? So if they're still missing after four or five, however many days. Yeah, it's not it's not a good it's not a good outlook. It's interesting with these fires, it seems like they're spurting up all over the place and they used to be what concentrated that you hear about this just, you know, <laughs> that's where you just expect to hear wildfires right. and it almost became just... Uh, yeah, yeah, wildfires again in California. But sure. we're, we're starting to feel it in other places in the world, even if you're not feeling it per se, even we were talking about just the, the smoke the quality of air yeah in um, chicago like how how there's wildfires in canada that's blowing smoke all the way that goes through chicago and all the way to the east coast mm-hmm. it's that's insane how much smoke are we talking about like how much fire are we really talking about it's kind of mind-boggling you don't see it on the news you don't see pictures of the wildfires of the huge huge amounts of land i mean canada is so big mm-hmm. when the, how much canada must be just on fire right now like how much death are we talking about and you you feel for families. people who are probably like living close to those fires and i think a lot of those places are like you know indigenous people living there still and you know what's happening uh, to them this is what's happening to them this is something that we're not talking about everyone wants to talk, about, about, to talk about trump being indicted you yeah. know for the fifth fourth fourth or fifth time but they don't they don't want to talk about other big issues that are affecting people and i guess it's just what the news does every time but that's why we have to be out here also having a voice mm-hmm. absolutely 
But anyway, yeah, it's, it's tragic to hear about Hawaii. You really just hear, you really just hope that those people get the help that they need. You don't really, I, I'm not one to or really be thinking people should rely on government assistance, but if there's ever a time for the government to try to assist, it should be in a problem like this. At least bring them some food, at least like give them something so they can try to rebuild their houses and their businesses and stuff like that. But I heard that they gave like maybe, uh, so far maybe about a billion dollars they've invested in Hawaii. Who knows who's gonna receive that money, but compare that to over a hundred billion dollars in counting to Ukraine. Yeah, but it, it's interesting when you say about like the government should step in and, and do something. What I have been hearing about these tragedies is that it's still like the human beings helping other human beings yeah. with the food, even the support that is coming. It can be stuck somewhere where it's like, OK, well, they may be have the food or the resources there, but it's actually people like getting on their own, using their own resources and to take the food and, and, and search for people and yeah. trying to help. Um, I was just reading where there's like a tourism business, they like mm -hmm. shut down their commercial operations indefinitely in order to like let their port be a space where everyone can kind of bring resources and then it can be re redistributed by from there. They're yes. making their vehicles available and stuff like that. So yeah, people pulling together is always a story that's like a good story to hear. Mm -hmm. You just you just feel for these people and hope that they don't end up falling to predatory situations because mm -hmm. you're already hearing about like commercial developers calling people and asking to buy their land. And it's like, man, like they probably might still have loved ones missing that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I talk about scoundrels, scoundrelry. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like this funny word. Like, That's a new word? Yeah. Scoun <laughs> Scoundrel? <laughs> Scoundrelry. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> we need we need we a new word. word. We need a new word we, because we it's like we need some new words. We have to we, some like at some point it's like the words that we are already using fail to describe what's really going on. <laughs> you know, we need a new word. Scoundrelry. Okay. The other thing is speaking of scoundrelry, Rendemsevere. The guy was telling you about. I never even heard of this, but so um, apparently, you know, Rendemsevere is a drug that was released under emergency authorization by the FDA or one of those letter agencies to treat COVID nineteen. And while they're not allowing people to use other doctors, were getting fired for using hydroxychloroquine and and what's the other one? whatever, ivermectin, I think, and then they're firing people over that. So you have drugs that have been used for decades, but they're not being authorized under emergency use act, even though you don't really need to enact a new law because they're already available to the public. Mm -hmm. They didn't need to pass a new law to let people use them, and people were having success using them, and they didn't go and say, hey, we're gonna rigorously study this and because maybe there's something to it. Maybe it'll work. They just want to say, hey, th there's this new drug we want to push for Nesuvir, then because they make more money on that one. So that one's put out by Gilead. Anyway, come to find out they have like some batches of it that had glass shards in it. And then they did a recall. One guy, and I'm probably the only one, probably not the only one, but the only one I've heard of, he took two or more doses of this and did. He had two strokes and I had to have his leg amputated. So. Wow. And then the company, Gilead, put on screen, Gilead, don't, don't trust this company. Because what they did, they said, oh, because this drug was released under emergency authorization, we should not be liable for damages. So they're trying to get out of compensating this family, which really there's no compensation for this type of situation. But, you know, even that, like, they don't even have the integrity to offer an apology and say, sorry, we didn't meet to for this to happen, it was a mistake or whatever, we did a recall, but let us try to help you with something. That would have, that would have been decent, you know, it, it would have been something. That, yeah, thing. but it's just outright scoundrelry. Yeah. <laughs> it's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame, but it's one of those things that you hear time and time again about how the, the medical system, it works here. It's like they're really not in a position where they're trying to help and aid people they don't care people. it's about the it's bottom business. line it's a business yeah and then the more they can make the more they can make on their on their drugs the more they can fatten their pockets that's really what they're concerned with and then that means they, like, have a they want to make sure that you keep buying their medicine well we could go on and on and on 
But like, at least make it when you make a mistake. I mean, have some integrity, man. I mean, yeah. come on, man. A little bit of human decency. A little bit, like, but as you see, it's just outright scoundrelly. There's no concern for a human human life. And then, like, this is the same feeling feel we're calling healthcare. And I'm, while I'm on my seat, my soul box right now, I want to say one thing, okay? All you people talking about healthcare should be free. The health care is a human right. What kind of care are we talking about when these are the kind of companies that we have running our health care system? Man, y'all can go on somewhere with that. What about bringing back the value of traditional herbal healing, natural healing? Because that's what worked for humanity for a very long time. And we didn't have these incidences, high incidences of cancer, diabetes, and high blood pressure, and heart disease, heart attacks. Teenagers getting heart attacks now. Teenagers dying from heart attacks. I mean, come on. Athletes, the healthiest, so-called healthiest people out here dying from heart attacks. These aren't people who are dying because they don't have health care. Come on. It's because the health care system is not care. It's just scoundrelry. Put it, put it, put it on the screen again. Scoundrelly. I yeah, say right. 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 <laughs> hey, look, I, I, <laughs> it's a hard one. It's a tongue twister. Scoundrel Re. Scoundrel Re. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> all right, all right. So, yeah, you have anything else before we cut over to Babu Sunjata? Mm, I'm ready to start the interview. Let's go. Okay. Oh, what about our, um, do we have a proverb for the week? Do we have a proverb for the week? Oh, if you don't educate someone, you give them a chance to hurt you. Since we're talking about education, traditional African co- uh, proverb. And on, on that Let's note, say it again, like in a if you, yeah, if you don't educate someone, you give them a chance to hurt you. Well, someone who doesn't know. I mean, I, all we have to do is look in our neighborhoods. That's all we have to do is look in our neighborhoods. We have many people out here who's uneducated, and because of the lack of education, and when I say education. I'm not just talking about they don't know how to read and write. They don't know how to add and subtract. That's another issue. And that's an issue, too. That's an issue, too. But cultural education will be what enables people to function together as a group. Mm -hmm. And no no right from wrong, no good from bad, no decency from scoundrelry. And if you don't, if you don't, How many times are we not picking that? If you don't, like, I'm not a role, okay? If you don't educate somebody, if someone if someone is doing something wrong, and you don't stop them, and they say something, something and you don't say something, and maybe you don't say something because at the time you feel like it's not affecting you mm-hmm. at the time at that moment you feel like it's not hurting you so you don't say anything or it's well, none of your business right oh it's none of your business that's the one everyone likes to say mm-hmm. but if you don't say anything today tomorrow that person might be breaking in your door mm-hmm. that might person might be knocking your mom over so whatever whatever you when you see someone you who needs correction you know in the right moment, in the right way, see what you can do. We are in a society where saying something to somebody is almost like a crime. Like a person can be committing a crime, but the crime will be you saying something about it or you doing something something about it. That's what society will crucify you for. Mm-hmm. And, and the person who's doing the crime, if they just doing them. They just live in their best life mind your own business Mm -hmm. and this is how our society is uh, degenerating more and more bill gates is on the prowl right now trying to replace teachers with ai artificial intelligence for teachers so that's the big thing now that because the salaries for teachers are too high this is an expense that we need to eliminate what i want to know is who is bill gates to be speaking (laughs) on such matters it's not his money being spent (laughs) come on man this guy wants to talk he wants to be the one to solve the climate crisis uh, the food crisis the disease epidemics and all this stuff it's like are you actually causing the problems that you're talking about you have solutions for like what's what kind where does where do you come from like where where 
are is there like a nexus that material like scoundrels are just materializing from this nexus for like like is that he, I know human beings right we can be pretty bad but come on like at, at a certain point you just gotta wonder like where where did you come from where did you come from I don't know and where are they taking us to that's the bigger problem it's like if we are following their lead because we think they're so smart they're so intelligent they're so wealthy that oh they must have all the answers they must have all the solutions yeah you'll follow somebody right over a cliff because you're not thinking for yourself because you don't have a cultural understanding and background that that you'll just fall for anything. And that's what, what, what we're doing. We're seeing it day in and day out. Like you were just talking about the technology that we've just gotten so lazy that we don't want to think for ourselves. We want somebody else to think for us. And so we can go do social media, so we can go to the ball game, so we can do something ridiculously stupid and, and, and think that's fun. And that's how our society is going. And that's why we need initiation. <laughs> we'll be right back with Baba Sunjata. How long have you been the principal since its inception? No, actually, that's I, that's a story within itself. Um, I started at Betty Shabazz. I've been in education for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I started in the Chicago public school system. Mm -hmm. I worked at two different schools. One, I worked at Price. Then I worked at Cone Elementary School. Okay. And it was one thing that I noticed. I was very into the culture very early. My father kind of introducing me different books, different speakers, mm -hmm. and listening to videotapes. So as he was really into the culture, me growing up into it early in high school really got me involved. So mm -hmm. when I started working as an educator in a public school system, I, I still kept my cultural sense, my cultural awareness, and my identity. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, I would wear my my suits, and then I would wear a daishiki from time to time. And I noticed that when I wore daishiki, that people were, I'm not gonna say that they were offended, but I can sense that they felt a way about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was in our community. This is in Roseland area. Mm -hmm. And to me, it, it just, I didn't think about it. This is just something naturally that how I dress. I, and so what I noticed is that Whenever I did wear my suit, people went out of their way to compliment me. Like, oh, you look really nice today. I love that suit. As if to say, this is how I want you to look. This is how I want you to present yourself. Mm -hmm. And it was such a, just an, an awakening uh, in our feeling um, that I, I was beginning to understand that there was a part of me that was accepted, but the cultural part of me was kind of like, we don't want that part. Mm -hmm. We just need you here as the teacher, as the educator. Right. But the cultural piece, we didn't want. Gotcha. And to me, that let me know that this may not be the environment for me. Mm -hmm. It was just through the creator's graces that I bumped into a longtime friend of mine, Mama Makita. Just, I was at Chicago State, working on the gym. I was able to just use the gym because I graduated from there. And we met, I was in high school, and I explained my situation. She said that she found I was in education and what my life's mission was, what my beliefs were. And she said, oh, I got the school for you. And I was like, really? And she was like, yes, you have to interview. You come on down. To the school is called Betty Shabazz International Charter Schools at that time. And so I went in the interview, and at that time, I was a certified teacher, minored in history, so I was like, I want to teach history. Mm -hmm. And at that time, history teachers, everybody wanted to be a history teacher, especially mm -hmm. at a cultural school. Mm -hmm. uh, so they said, well, do you have any math background? I said, well, I was an architect major for two years at Tuskegee. I'm decent at math. I have my certification, I could teach, I like math, I have history in it. So yeah, I can do that. But they weren't sold on the idea because I had only had one year of classroom experience and one year as a full-time based substitute. So they say, you don't have enough experience, but we'll let you come in as a teacher's assistant. And so coming from a salary at Chicago Public Schools, to a teacher's aid position at a charter school mm. was 
a significant cut, mm -hmm. significant cut in pay. Mm -hmm. But I got the sense that this was home. This was the environment mm -hmm. that I wanted to be in. So I took that cut. I said, I'll accept the teacher's assistant position. Now I'm certified, I'm a certified teacher. Right. And I'm gonna take a TA's position. They didn't feel I had the experience. So I said, okay, that's what I'll do. So I came in the door helping other teachers. Mm. And when was this? What year was this? This was in 1999. Okay. Mm. I came in helping other teachers and they whatever they needed, bulletin boards, papers copied, everything getting this, getting the year ready for the parents and students mm -hmm. to come. And so there was one classroom they still haven't hired. It was a fifth grade math and science classroom. They still haven't hired a teacher yet. And at that time, people were starting to look like we're getting closer, the families are coming. And they said, well, you might have it. I said, well, I'm just gonna do my part. My role is to be the TA. I'm gonna wait for the teacher to come. Everybody's there interviewing. And so the principal said, the day the parents were coming, it, it got all the way down to the day. And I said, well, what do you want me to do with the classroom? And she said, well, actually, this is going to be your classroom. You're going to be the math teacher. And I want you to go downstairs and talk to the parents and tell them what you're going to be teaching for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so that was Mama E? No, that was Mama Davenport. Okay. So Mama Stephanie that. Davenport. And she still she's still with the community. She still works with us. Okay. But I went downstairs and from that point of me meeting the parents, it was like magic. Mm. Because the parents saw me and they was like, oh my God, a male teacher? I want my son, everybody who had a son said, I want my son in his class. Mm. And so I ended up with a class for like all boys and I still just had just a few girls. Mm. So there was another fifth grade class. And so I said, well, just take these girls and give me a few more boys. And it just turned out to be a spectacular year. Okay. Not only did I find out I love teaching mathematics, but just also being in that family cultural environment, there was nothing better. I felt like there were days where I just wanted to be at work. If I wasn't feeling good, I can go to work because the children and the families and the staff, they just uplifted me and made me just feel great. And just being able to dress and be myself. Mm -hmm. uh, when you can go to work and you can be yourself, you, you can't beat that. And so I loved it. So from then on, I became, eventually became uh, head of the math department, working very closely with the principal at that particular time. When Mama E came, after Mama E moved up to become the superintendent, Mama Makita became the principal. Mm -hmm. And then after M Mama Makita became the superintendent, then I became the principal, so I've been the principal of Shabazz for 13 years. So it's, yeah, wow. it's been a long journey. Mm -hmm. I bet. So we were planning to ease into the interview and kind of start with a casual conversation, but it looked like we're in the interview. <laughs> <laughs> we can cut the casual just, conversation just too. for our just for our uh, the the optics or whatever. Welcome to the sun, Chicago Sunnyside oh, podcast. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got it right here. Yeah, we. Thank you. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's an honor to be here. When Baba Drew asked me to do it, I was sincerely appreciative. I'm like, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, I love it. So, We're um, appreciati appreciating that you came. Yeah, yeah, really, so. really. So, this is you're our, our second interviewee. Last last week we interviewed Baba Patrick Woodter of the African Fest. Oh, so wow. we're That's excellent. getting off on the right foot with big wigs such as yourself. So I feel like humbled and honored that you would come to our studio. And, oh, well, well, thank you very much. I really I thought you were doing this for years. <laughs> no, we just started. We, we just started the podcast. We've been doing media for years. We we used to have the Sunnyside newspaper. Yeah. You may remember. Yeah. Uh, so we yeah. just now transitioning to doing a video component. And uh, yeah, this is our second interview that we're doing, and it's wow. it's groundbreaking to have people such as yourself and who are who have been entrenched in our struggle here in Chicago for many years and hearing that story it definitely hits home for me because I was in similar situations trying to uh, uh, present myself 
authentically, yeah. but in, in environments where that's not normal. And yeah. uh, so I know exactly where you're coming from. Betty Shabazz always for me was like a home environment. And like you like like you have home field advantage <laughs> at the game or something like that. So Yes. Um, yeah, I definitely appreciate you. You were there when, when I first started working Mm-hmm. with you guys with the after school and the summer programs and stuff yes. like that in 2005 and so you've always been someone very I don't know sincere open genuine person and uh, I haven't seen you teach per se but yes. uh, I could tell you know your name already says that you're culturally centered and why don't we go there why don't we talk about the name of Sunjata can you say it? tell us how you got that name okay that's that's another interesting story I was practicing I wanted to be a drummer Mm-hmm. So there was a a drum class that was on the corner of 79th, I think maybe Ingleside, just a few blocks from the school. And at that time, mm-hmm. I don't even think, uh, was I even connected? It was before I even got to Shabazz, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Baba Asante was the teacher. He held a, a drum class and I wanted to be a drummer. Mm-hmm. And so he taught me everything in terms of the djembe like i could break all the strings all of the rings take the skin off everything we can go buy a ghost skin with the, the fur on it and everything he mm. taught me how to put it on soak the skin shave it all the rhythms i can play cuckoo frokaba kakilambe manjani just all types of rhythms so mm. in, the, in not just teaching about the rhythms he also taught the history of the instrument, where certain cultures, <coughs> just the meanings behind the songs. And then we got to one particular song, and it had to do with Mali, the ancient civilization of Mali, not Mali that actually exists now, mm. but in its historical context. Right. And so he started to talk about the story of Sunjata and, and the songs that we were playing to go along with it. And I became very interested. I'm like, wow. And he said, well, you, you should read the book, the biography. I was like, okay. And so I, I went and purchased the book. And as I was reading it, I was really like, okay, this guy is just this conqueror. He's this great king or whatever. But it wasn't necessarily like that at all. Hmm. He started off as crippled. That means he couldn't walk. Like he was born, he couldn't walk to like age 10 or 12. He was kind of, mm-hmm. he didn't have use of his legs. Mm-hmm. Where it was predicted, it was prophesied that this kid will become a king and eventually take over this kingdom. Mm-hmm. But reading the story and how he was able to do that after he gained use of his legs and the type of person that he was, was able to bring everybody together mm-hmm. to fight this, this, this common enemy that everybody had, like this emperor that was wicked. Mm-hmm. And the, when he brought everybody together and all of that, the type of person that he was, I felt that. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I'm like, that's the type of leader that I want to be. That's the type of person that I want to be. Mm-hmm. And I took that name. I was like, I want that name. That's, that's my name. Nice. And so I went, I went to work. It was, yeah, it was like once I started working at Shabazz, maybe a few years in, uh, I was like, I want to be called Sanjata. Mm-hmm. Mama Makita was on the morning circle. She was like, okay. She was like, for now on, Baba Shannon is going to be called this Baba Sanjata from that day forward mm. and never look back. Nice. And so now when somebody calls me Shannon, I'm like, oh, you must don't know me. <laughs> she don't know me that way, but that's okay. Or maybe they've known you for a long time. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, way before, right. You had to know me way before Shabazz. Right, right. Yeah. That's why anyone who don't call me Kasavez, I'd be like, well, <laughs> right. you right. must know me from like... Childhood. Yeah, yeah. you're not a loop guy. <laughs> so tell us about your childhood. How did you grow up? Where did you grow up? What that, led you into education? That's a, that's wow. That's another whole day. Yeah, but <laughs> I would try to keep it as brief as possible. Mm-hmm. My childhood was rough. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother and father separated right when I was born, oh. so I really have very little experience ever seeing them in the same room. Where my brother and I, we were kind of caught in the middle. Mm-hmm. Where my father, an outstanding educator. Uh, He was teacher of the year at one point. He was a physical education teacher, but not only an outstanding teacher, an outstanding father. I had two outstanding parents. My mother and father were both 
great people. Mm -hmm. They loved us, but they just couldn't get along. Right. So we were kind of caught in the middle. The thing that I that I realized as I got older is that all of the struggles, when you're in the middle of, of two warring parents, that all of the challenges that I went through growing up, it really helped me understand children today what they go through with their families. Mm -hmm. If I never experienced the hardship of growing up in a divided family, I would not have the level of empathy that I have today in terms of when we talk about developing the whole child, mm -hmm. that means understanding them as a whole, not just as a student. Mm -hmm. So me understanding, looking at them and the possible struggles that they may be having at home helps me address them, their situation, and as we make decisions, we make decisions in terms of what their challenges may be, not only in school, but maybe at home. And when we look at the whole child, we make decisions based on that. It becomes, you have a lot better outcome. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I struggled. I went to seven elementary schools. I moved all over the place. Mm -hmm. One day I'm living with my dad, and then my dad, we don't like each other. The next minute I'm moving with my mom, and then it's like, oh, you now got to go back to your dad. So I did a lot of moving around. My dad and I were very similar. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we ended up, I ended up following the same path as he did. Mm -hmm. He was a principal, and the interesting part is, is that he was principal of Arthur Ashe Elementary School. It's only a mile away from Shabazz. We were mm -hmm. principals at the same time in the same community. Mm -hmm. And it took him a while to realize that we were really a lot alike. Mm -hmm. And so when we found that out, and it wasn't because of us. It was because enough people were going, was going to him to tell him, like, your son, you all are just alike. You all are just alike. When we grew up, we were, that really hurt us that we were alike. Because it was like, man, I hate, we hate each other. Hmm. But it was like we were bumping heads because we were so similar. Wow. And once we realized that, that this was a positive thing that we were alike, it just, it manifested. So growing up was tough. I'm glad I experienced what I experienced. It, it has helped me be, as an educator. It has helped me as a father. But yeah, it was not an easy road. Mm -hmm. Not an easy road. A lot of bumps. And yeah. just out of curiosity, what about your grandfather? <sighs> My grandfather. I, I Well, two grandfathers. Mm -hmm. My father's father I never met. Mm -hmm. But I, I hear so many wonderful stories about mm -hmm. him. He owned his own cleaners. He was a great dad. He died in my father's arms at 12 years old. Wow. My other grandfather, my mother's father, is, I wish I could show you a picture. I don't have time to do that. But he's my twin. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at his picture and I'm like, wow. And to hear his stories of how he grew up. Mm -hmm. I actually, he gave me a home. I lived in a home that he grew up in as a child. And just our relationship before he died, he walked me around the home and he helped me learn how to fix everything in the house. Like if doors were not aligned or needed to be taken out, I learned how to put the, the little dolls in there and all of that, every little thing he was able to teach me before he died. And we were able to develop a, such a, a great relationship before he passed. I was... I will forever remember that. Mm -hmm. So the men that I had in my life are just out, just outstanding. Even the, uh, the stepfather, my, my grandmother, uh, she was married to another man who I actually thought was my father, mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather. I had no idea that he wasn't until years later, uh, until I actually I had a chance to really embrace my grandfather. And he was spectacular. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of love and sense in terms of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful. That's good. That, that reminds me of the village concept, and I know that's something that Betty Shabazz is really, we always affectionately refer to it as the village. Mm -hmm. And that's a good segue to get into the school itself. And what can you tell us about Betty Shabazz and maybe in contrast to the average public school that pe people may be experienced with? Oh, wow. That's, that's a deep question. Betty Shabazz serves the same children, they serve the same families. The difference is, is that we believe that culture is the cure for a lot of the issues that we have today. We believe that is very important 
that the children get a firm understanding of who they are as individuals, what their ancestors' contributions are, and what contributions that they are prepared to make and can learn how to make in the future to impact their community and the world, not just impact themselves, not just to become prosperous. Hey, I got mine, and now I'm gonna live this certain life. We make sure that when you get out there, whatever you decide to be, what contribution are you gonna to make to this society? So that's the difference, the major difference. And that's it happens through culture as a foundation, but when you get out here, how are you gonna contribute? Mm -hmm. Not how are you gonna prosper, not, not how much money you're gonna make. We want our students to be successful, but we want them to contribute. Let this, let your prosper be a community thing. So what are we doing? Now, how do you instill that in the children? in the families, in the communities, because as you stated that CPS, they serve the same communities that Betty Shabazz does, mm -hmm. but we can definitely see like in the, the community that the school is in, mm -hmm. there's a lot of challenges there. So how are you trying, how are you instilling culture in those children and families? Okay, well, by making sure that culture is integrated in everything that we do. From the time that they enter the school, the very first thing that they do every day is that they join us, the entire school joins into a unity circle. Mm -hmm. And on that unity circle, we're bringing out the red, black, and green flag, and we are giving our pledge to our nation. We are all wearing African clothes. We are, it's very, our talk and our walk is very much aligned. Mm -hmm. So it's embedded in the food that we eat. We're a vegetarian school. It's embedded into our lessons. We don't, we integrate into every lesson, no matter what it is, some sort of African principle or African culture or some make some sort of connection that has to do with them. When we choose books, when we choose novels, is make sure that it's our authors, our people, so they're getting our exposure. And it's not that we disagree with diversity. We love diversity. We want the diversity, but we want our children to be prepared when they go out into the society that they're ready, that they're confident, that they're strong, that they're mm -hmm. self-esteem, that they're knowledge, that nobody can define them, that they can define themselves. Mm -hmm. So when we celebrate holidays like Kwanzaa, all of those principles are in there. So we do a lot of things to integrate that culture. And even in our speech, they don't go to the washroom, they go to the choke. They don't eat food, they eat shakula. They eat everything. When, they, when we need your attention, it's go. So they're used to hearing that. When they are referring to one of the teachers, it's not Mr. or Mrs., it's Mama and Baba. Mm -hmm. That means something. You say Mama enough, that connection is made. Mm -hmm. You say Baba enough, that connection is made. It's not, I'm not Mr. Mason. And if I was Mr. Mason, automatically, there is some sort of line that is drawn. There is some sort of disconnect. But when I'm your Baba, mm -hmm. that means that I just don't want respect. That means that I'm going to treat you like my own. So what, what would you say some of the challenges are that, that you face as a school? I mean, for sure... We've seen a lot of schools come and go just in the last 20 or so years. Uh, probably since you've been over there, you've seen schools come and go shut down, and mm -hmm. especially even CPS schools. A lot of schools have been closing. Mm -hmm. uh, so for sure you guys are facing challenges. So how do you guys, you know, what are some of the challenges you guys face, and then how do you, how do you address that? Well, academically, one of the challenges is, is to make sure that we keep up the level of rigor that pushes our students towards high expectations because schools are closing because a lot of times it is their test scores. Mm -hmm. If you are not able to get the test scores met up to proficiency, then you can be in trouble. But if you look across the state of Illinois, in ELA from third to eighth grade, only 35% of the students are proficient at their grade level from third to eighth grade. 35%. You if said you in Illinois, in the Illinois, whole, story, whole in, state? In, in the entire state, 35%. Wow. And that's being generous. In mathematics, we're more so looking maybe at 28 to 30%. And if you're looking at just black children alone, you're looking at 20% mm. of students that are on grade level from third to eighth grade across the state. Yeah. So when you're looking at percentages that low, you can imagine there are challenges. So in our own particular community, the, the level that we want our students to reach, 
the bar is set really high. The assessments no longer just taste, test basic skills. Mm. It felt like in the beginning, when we were taking tests, it just tested the basic skills. The Iowa test, our children were here, and then we started building up. And mm. once our children started mastering these skills and we started doing well on this test, it was like, no, we gotta set the bar higher. So they pushed the bar higher. We're taking the Illinois Standard uh, Assessment Test, the ISAT test. Mm. So then, okay, now the bar is set higher. And when we mastered that, they set it even higher. And now they, they've given a test that is so challenging, many teachers would even fail this test. Wow. And it is a rigorous test. The standards are, are challenging, but it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's something that you want. You want to push. If we're gonna compete against other countries around the world, you have to push the level. Mm -hmm. But the families and the communities, they sincerely have to prioritize education. We notice that the students that do well are the students whose parents are invested and they really have education as the highest priority. Mm -hmm. So when you have that level of support, you're gonna have that level of success. Right. But many of our families, a lot of them don't necessarily put education as their highest priority. A lot of them are just out here surviving. Mm -hmm. And so they, they may not have college degrees. They may not have master's degrees. They love their children. But education has not been the vehicle necessarily that they have used to thrive. Mm -hmm. So we have to push to say, hey, this is important. Let's work together to make sure that we get your child, our children prepared for this future that we are heading towards. Because this future that we're heading towards, they're cutting out a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be a lot of opportunities that are created, but there are going to be a lot of opportunities that have been cut. Right. So we have to get prepared for this new future. And that's, we were talking about that before this session, that whole balance that we're trying to find, because there's definitely the academic component that we have to recognize, but then you also have to have the just Behavior. behavioral component to children and mm -hmm. how they are able to just even interface and interact with society at large. And that's what we tend to find like in communities that are more impoverished, communities that are not as invested in the academic world, mm -hmm. you'll find a lot of behavioral issues. So that is like a big challenge. Like how do you all address the behavioral challenges that you may find in the community at Petty Shabazz? Well, the biggest thing is, number one, is not to be punitive, okay? It's like when something happens wrong, we want to correct it, but we want to give every student, every situation, an opportunity to be restored, like you could restore the balance. We just don't say, okay, you did this wrong, you're suspended, you need to be out of here, or we're putting you out of class, we're putting you out of school, or whatever. We do understand that the consequences need to be had for repeated offenses, but it is critical that you understand why the child is making the mistake. There are reasons, there are things that are happening at home, there are underlining situations that are occurring that if you get down to the bottom of the why, you'll understand why a student is having a bad day. You'll even understand why teachers are having a bad day. A lot of times things are happening that may not be food at home. Mm -hmm. This child was stuck at home with the city their, their brother's sister all night long, didn't have a chance to do any homework. They've been up all night. This another child, they may have a cell phone and the parent is not aware that they're on their cell phones at three or four o'clock in the morning. Another child is experiencing social bullying and they're getting text messages, they're on Instagram, they're on Twitter, and they're being bullied, they're being harassed by their peers. And a lot of those situations are coming out and they're manifesting as bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And so if you hadn't gotten any sleep, of course, right. if you're hungry, of course, if you are frustrated because you're not even feeling love, you haven't had a hug in a week. Mm. you're going to be frustrated. So when you're addressing the whole child, you're not just addressing that situation, but you're trying to get down to what is the actual cause, what is the real cause, what's happening outside of school that's causing these issues. So when you approach it, you try to find a solution of something that can connect to what the real problem is. Because we see a lot of result. We see a lot of residue. 
from issues that manifest through you're not eating properly. You, you have a diet of junk food. You have a mental diet of junk food, just social media, negative, watching fighting, watching pranks, watching provocative material. They have too much exposure and access to the world that I never had. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff, that, a lot of residue that comes out of that, a lot of behaviors that comes out of that, we have to understand that that's not bad behavior. They're just reacting to the food, whether it's mental, social, emotional, or spiritual, they're reacting to that. So we have to resolve these things, fix these things, and have discussions with the families. These are things that you need to do so the proper healing can begin. We, don't, we just don't punish. That's the wrong thing to do. Just put them away, lock them up, lock them away. Mm -hmm. That doesn't solve anything. Right. So when you say it's not bad behavior, what, what do you call that? Negative behavior. Negative behavior. Yeah. So you have tools, processes to address the negative behavior? People, resources, processes, all of those things. Like our detention room, mm -hmm. where the dean sit, mm -hmm. is called the cool down room. Mm -hmm. And the cool down room saves us. That's an opportunity. If something happened, if two students get into it, if a teacher and student may get into it, you go straight to the cool down room and cool down, mm -hmm. okay? We have had parents to get into it, let's say they're outside and they get into it. You all need to come upstairs, let's, let's cool down first. And then once you get into, the, get into the cool down room, we have what's called reflection forms. So you're just gonna reflect. And on this form, we ask, well, what happened? What could you have done differently? reflect on that. Mm -hmm. So as you reflect on what you did wrong, a lot of our students, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, okay. I could have did this differently. Mm -hmm. I did this wrong, okay. So when you get down to it, you really start getting to the bottom of what really happened. Then you find out, yeah, nothing to do with school anyway. Mm -hmm. This is some personal stuff mm -hmm. that's actually going on. Mm -hmm. So those type of processes for us has been beneficial. Mm -hmm. And then there are opportunities where if you need to restore justice, you get down to that lunchroom, mm -hmm. wipe those tables. Mm -hmm. You go help such and such teacher. Mm -hmm. Make sure that those students, those primary students get the support that they need. So it's not punitive, we don't punish. We have consequences that we have had situations where if you need, you know, if you need to be expelled because of some really dangerous stuff, we don't hesitate, safety is first. But, we like to restore justice, restore balance, and get the students moving in the right track. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear because, and that's something that we do in our schools as well, that whole component that you were talking about, reflection. We often have conflict. We often have situations that you need a solution to, but the first and for foremost thing is like looking at the reflective part of it, looking at the self to see what I could have done differently and how did I contribute to this situation and that's very good to hear yeah, that. And I, and I have to give a lot of credit to my administrative team, Baba Drew especially in terms of dealing with the discipline at school. He's phenomenal. He's very consistent. The best thing he does is set the example. Mm -hmm. By being a righteous person, they have somebody to identify that they can look at and say, okay, this is the correct behavior. I see his behavior. Well, they don't see that on 79th Street. They don't see that in their neighborhoods. But when they come to school, if you see that, you're modeling that, and they like you, they don't want to be that. Mm -hmm. So that's all a part of it as well. Modeling mm -hmm. is just as critical as anything else. You know, you can correct the situation by demonstrating, mm -hmm. and that also helps. So. Yeah, and we've seen Betty Shabazz grow over the years and, and as uh, stated, face a lot of challenges. There were times where the school was being threatened to be closed because yes. of academics and the like. How did you all overcome that? And I, from my understanding, it's still a challenging position that mm -hmm. Betty Shabazz faces on the academic side. Uh, the, uh, the academic piece is always a challenge. What we are doing is that we make sure now that we are getting our teachers the level of professional development and coaching needed for them to be successful. Mm -hmm. Training teachers is probably one of the most important things you can do in a school. Mm -hmm. It's like getting them prepared, make sure that they are ready for the lessons, make sure that they understand the content because we found out throughout the years, teachers, sometimes their level of preparation, just doing a lesson plan 
it's not enough. It's like you really have to get into the content. You really have to learn this content enough so that when you're teaching it, you're prepared for three different students. You're prepared for the student who is a very high level learner so that they're not sitting there, I know this already, I'm bored, what's next? You want to be prepared for that student so that you can have the material set for an accelerated student. Then you want to have that be prepared for the student that is ready at that grade level. Say, okay, this is the material that we're teaching. And then you have to be prepared for the student that is working two to three years below grade level. You have to understand what are the misconceptions, what are, mis what are the things that they're misunderstanding, where is the learning gap, what do I need to do to be able to scaffold this lesson so that you can learn as well. So to be able to push all three of those different types of students forward and having work in them, having work collaboratively, homogeneous and heterogeneous at times, it depends, you have to be prepared. So training your teachers to do that while they're teaching is difficult, but we have put together a very strong team to be able to get that accomplished. So we have been pushing forward. And last year, just in terms of our English language arts department, uh, in terms of the test scores, our growth percentile was 3% away from the top 10% top of schools across the state. So the top 10%, they usually grow at the 60th percentile we grew at the 57th percentile last year. So the plan that we have put in place has been working. The state was very pleased. They didn't have anything to say during our meeting. They were like, hey, you all are growing fantastic. They consider the 40th percentile being, if you all are growing at that particular rate, you all are doing well. In mathematics, we were growing at the 45th, so you all are doing okay. In ELA, you are growing at the 57th percent. That means whatever you all are doing, keep doing it, keep pushing. You all are heading in the right direction. Direction. So we're moving up in a positive direction. Good, good. Now, what, if anything, can you do to address those students that you're talking about, those students or those families that are in that percentile that are not even focused on education, focused on performance and the like, but they still have to be interfacing and interacting with the children who are trying to excel. That to me is one of the most challenging things that I see with the families who are even trying to debate between whether I put my child in public school or if I put my child in a charter school or a private school in the or parents homeschool. or homeschool. Mm -hmm. Parents are really trying to struggle with that issue because of really the behavioral issues that they deal in the CPS and charter schools where they're having to interact with children who are just really not coming prepared mm -hmm. to learn or, and the like. And let, let me add one caveat to that question too. I noticed too when I was there that you do also have transfer students. So you have students who will come first year and I've seen students come in and trying to teach them, they don't really know how to write. They may be in fifth or sixth grade. They don't know how to do basic things that we probably want to be teaching in the first couple grade levels. So, yeah, how do you address all those type of situations? Okay, well, we have two things that we do. You have one, dealing with your classroom teacher, making sure that your classroom teacher is prepared. And then also, you have to make sure that the curriculum that you're using, you don't want to take the rigor away from the curriculum that you're using. You want to have that grade level rigor, even if students are below level. What we have to do to supplement that curriculum, to make sure that we're addressing all needs, even high and low performers, are we use what's called an adaptive online system. The system that we're using now is called iReady. There are a lot of systems out there, but at the beginning of every year, everyone takes a diagnostic test, an online test. And on that diagnostic test, the program is able to generate a learning path for every student. If you're a high performing student, it generates a learning path so you continue high performing. So is the programs that it's giving you and the problems that are giving the problem set that they are giving you are higher than normal. And that if you're in the middle, it creates a path for you to learn at your grade level. And then if you're low, it'll assign you a learning path of skill building activities, foundation strengtheners, so that you can continue to strengthen your foundation. And at the same time, it can set a learning path that allows you to gain what's called stretch growth. Not regular growth, but stretch growth. That means that a year's growth is not good enough for you because if you're two years below grade level, we don't want you to grow a year, we want you to grow 1.5. So we're gonna put you on a path to stretch your growth 1.5 years. So it 
brings you there, and then it pushes you a little bit further. So along with what the teacher is doing, we have other programs to help you shore up some of the skills that you may be weak in. We also hire interventionists. We have math interventionists and English language arts reading interventionists that come in to pull students out, or they may push into the classroom and work in small groups along with the interventionists. Like I said, we have coaches that coach the teachers, and sometimes coaches may pull students out as well. Mm -hmm. So we do our best to provide as much support as we can in school. And then we also have a, a tutoring program that we're instituting this year in mathematics because we see that that's our biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. So a little after school support helps as well. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you have a, a balance of teaching from the teacher, but also some of uh, something programmatic from the digital side. Yes. So you have like you have computers for all the students or yes we're one-to-one -one with technology okay and that that is not always the best mm -hmm. because sometimes at at schools at various schools who have the technology they lean too heavily on it the technology makes learning accessible to everyone but sometimes teachers if they see that they that they have the technology they can lean on the technology mm -hmm. And there is nothing more important than high quality instruction from the teacher. Technology doesn't do the full job. It can introduce materials, but the level of engagement that you need, the interaction that you need, the type of questions, the type of connection that you have, nothing is outside or better than that classroom instructor. So making sure that your teachers are, are really highly qualified and ready that's the best way to go, and that's what, what we have been doing. The technology is a plus. It does make it accessible. It does allow us to differentiate better. We have learning programs that can go from very low levels to high levels. It's great, but nothing is better than a classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of teachers, what... Because... Obviously, anyone going to a, to a college, a four-year college, and getting a degree in childhood education, that doesn't give a person the cultural reference point for what Betty Shabazz is really centered on. So how do you prepare the teachers culturally for, for the kind of environment that you all are fostering? Yeah, that, that's, that's a major task. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say that we give three weeks at the beginning of school for teacher training and but that's not enough it takes really it takes years of actual studying it mm -hmm. takes years of reading it takes years of research for you to really get involved and you have to be interested and really want to know the information teachers that that come to our school they know they're very clear before the, even in the interview you have to understand what culture you're walking into. This is a very unique situation. Mm -hmm. If you're not comfortable with being African, you might you might want to reconsider. Like this is for real. So we do. We have our teachers. We have selected readings and things and authors and speeches and all of those wonderful things that we engulf our teachers in. Like, but we really try to stimulate their interests. We. We, we have events at the school. We make sure that they come out to, for example, the Bantu Fest so that they can get that full exposure to get them immersed into the culture so that they can see what it's like. A lot of them have never been to the African Fest. A lot of them have never been to the Bantu Fest. So we try to get them out there. And then we understand that a lot of times that it, it's gonna take patience. And we, we do it not as revolutionaries, but we do it as agriculturalists. We plant seeds, okay? And, and that is with the understanding that every seed will not blossom at the same time. So it's a gradual process, and we know that some people are gonna come at different levels. Some people will come, they will have the knowledge, they will have the background, they will have already read a lot of the materials. And then other teachers who don't have it, be patient with them, give them the knowledge, plant the seed, and then allow it to grow, water it, nurture it, and by the end of the year, they will be ready. But it is not easy. Yeah, that's, that is one of the most challenging things that we can 
at least I can say as a parent, trying to find environments where I can see that my child is being culturally supported, yes. not just academically. And, and that has been, I can say every school that I've tried, that yes. has been the challenge. And then you end up uh, with homeschool as an alternative, which yes. is a beautiful alternative, but at the same time, you're trying to now balance that with supporting the family and all these other components as well. Did you have any other cultural related? Well, I was going to ask for parents and just understanding that there's a lot of, most of the parents in our communities are not culturally centered, African centered household. How, what would you say to the parents out here about the importance of the cultural centered piece of the cultural focus of education? Wow, that's 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 deep. It's I would tell these our parents that it's 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 critical. It's it's a matter of 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 our life and our death as a people. Hmm. Understanding who we are, understanding where we come from will give us much better direction into making a decision about where we're going. We haven't made a decision exactly, exactly about where we're going because we're not firm on where we come from. Mm. A small group of us going in one direction is, is, is just not enough. And getting, to ev- getting everyone to understand that this is a collective effort is difficult because we have grown up under the pedagogy of white supremacy and European way of thinking. Individualism. E- individualism. Yes. Even the way we educate our children is still, even in, even in African-centered institutions, even in our culture, we still educate, our classrooms are still very individualized, you're very focused. Mm-hmm. And so restructuring how we teach our students even so that they understand that learning is a collective effort. Very small things that we have to learn how things are d- done together as a family, not just the smaller unit of family, it's the same thing as the larger unit of family. Like we have to start working together as a family. And then knowing our history. I mean, we fall for the same tricks. I mean, if you, if you can look at, look at the number of people that were enslaved in just America, then those, that number, I don't know exactly how many million it was that were actually enslaved, but if you take that number and you relate it to the number of black people that are incarcerated right now, I bet that number is very similar. Mm. Absolutely, I would, yeah. Yeah, that number is the same. So legally enslaved, but you are incarcerated legally, you are still a slave. I bet that number is right on the top of each other. We, and we fall for the same thing. Uh, slavery, I, in my opinion, slavery would not have existed if we were actually working together. I do not believe that Europeans could have marched onto the continent and entrapped us without us being a part of that. I think if we had the collective unity and the collective thinking that we could, we need to come together to stop this, instead of using their tools weaponized against us so that we fighting each other can be a part of this slave labor institution, I believe if we had a collective thinking that history would have been changed altogether. Mm. But slavery is not like foreign to history. Like slavery is part of history and Mm. has been part of every culture, civilization's history. And to me, it's like, the, the part that we haven't been able to recover from slavery is because we have not gone back to our culture. Mm. We're continuing to rely on the colonial system and the colonial education and the mm. box that they have put us in, and that we're gonna continue to perpetuate that no matter how many schools, how many teachers, how many principals and all of these things, even Afrocentric curriculums that we build, yes. if it's still based on the colonial model, we're never going to recover from that. Yes. And so that's the part that it's just like, I, I love to see that Betty Shabazz is doing what they're doing. It's something I even enrolled my child into the school because I love that, the, the, the nurturing environment that it holds. Wonderful. That is something that is so very wonderful. But the part that it was a disconnect for me is because of it was like this whole unification that everybody is not on the same page 
on the cultural side because mm -hmm. one person's idea of culture looks very different from the next person's idea of yes. culture. If you think going to the Bantu Fest is culture, mm -hmm. then you're missing a mm -hmm. huge component. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not learning from traditional African people yes. and our idea of what America thinks is African, yes. and you think that's African, then you're we're still going to stay in inside yes. of that trap. So that's the part that is like, how do we get outside of those trappings? How do we get side outside of that colonized way of even thinking about Africa and going back to like a traditional African holistic way of thinking of of Africa? No, that that's a question. Within a question, within a question. No, no, but that is definitely the question that needs to be asked mm -hmm. if we are going to save ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. We need to, that question needs to be answered to be addressed fully if we're going to be heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Because right now we're just, we're just heading in a direction. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we're doing, even though it seems prosperous, we're just kind of running in circles. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, our communities are still not being developed, mm -hmm. and there's still a lot of challenges that are going on. Right. So, Because the state will say, oh, you're doing well because we're following along the way they want us to follow. They're yes. still basing their prison system based upon how our children are doing in math, yes. how our children are doing in science, how our children are doing in reading. We yes. know we need to build this many prisons because these children are not performing. In third grade. In third grade. It's absolutely, which is scary. You have to teach certain things with math, with science, with history and things like that. Mm -hmm. All of that didn't come from African cultures. The cultures of our ancestors that they were, that are being preserved or that were, our ancestors came from when they were captured and put on the slave ships and all that. Mm -hmm. Whatever they were doing in their villages and their cities, what they were learning in their education systems was something totally different than what we're having to teach academically now. Yes. So how do you strike the balance to the two different kind of worldviews that, that you see yourself continuing with? Well, it's, it's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. And whatever you teach, that's why they call it like an African-centered perspective. Mm -hmm. So whatever our children are learning, it, we try to make sure that it comes from our perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, they can learn about any culture, anything, any society, any, just anything. But you're learning it, looking at it through the eyes of an African person. Mm -hmm. But that is not an easy task because first you have to understand that you are an African person mm -hmm. and what that means. So just, we're just kind of scratching the surface. And it's not nothing that I'm ashamed of. I understand that this is where we are. This is the condition that we're in. Mm -hmm. But I definitely want to be a part of that solution. So any surface that we're scratching, mm -hmm. like I'm heading in the right direction, is the movement that I want to be a part of. I hear you. <laughs> And that's what we, we even discussed that as well, in a sense that even though we're asking these questions, this isn't just a Betty Survives issue. This oh, is sure. not, not just a city of Chicago issue. Right. This is a, a situation that we're dealing with nationwide. Not even nationwide, it's Worldwide. global. Worldwide, it is a global yes. solution or situation. But I do look at, for example, we have families that have moved to West Africa as a part of our culture and community. And to look at the children that are born here and then they have to go to Medita or Africa, as you would say, and they learn there, they're completely two different children completely two different children, even the ones who may have some behavioral issues or behavioral challenge, mm -hmm. challenges coming from the West and going to Medita, they come back almost transposed, if you will, because yeah. it's like they are embracing the culture there mm -hmm. and culture there has so much to do with respect. Yes. And that piece is so missing from this society here, that notion of respect. Yes. And one of the sisters that left here and w took her children to Medita, she 
kind of struggle with that at the beginning because she's like, my children aren't learning what sh- they should be at grade level mm. because she, there, one, they, they had, there was a language barrier. So they, one, had to start a little lower because of the language barrier. And mm. then, two, they had to learn all the cultural things, too. So how to greet, how to bow, how to respect the elders, all of these things. And it's like, you think like, well, they need to be learning math. They need to be learning science. They need to be learning all of this. But if they don't learn culture, they don't learn that respect it's like all the other stuff goes to the wayside but Mm -hmm. as you were stating like that whole notion of of getting the cultural understanding first and foremost then all the academia on top of that yes it has a place to go yes but if you're trying to even do them at the same time it's like you've got some wanting to do it some not wanting to do it yes it's a it's a huge huge issue that we're dealing with and we really do have to find some collective solutions because Mm -hmm. it's not one person or one community, one group, one school, one principal, one institution's problem. This is a, a, a huge problem for all of us that we have to come together to find some collective solutions that can, like you said, save our, our children. We saving ourselves by saving our children. Yes. So putting the energy there. I love that. I'm learning. Mm-hmm. I, I love that you said that because yeah. that gives me a perspective of something that I should really think about. Just this changing habits, not just learning habits, but life habits as a mm-hmm. part of our school environment. Some of the things that we that we teach and talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was critical. doing after school, I was working with After School Matters for several years, and one of the things they had an emphasis on was what they call soft skills. Yeah, soft skills. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, for those not in the academic f- field or education field, soft skills would be like life skills, communication skills, being on time, you yeah. know, effort, th- you know, things of that nature that, that's not measurable in terms of taking a test. Mm-hmm. But it it's really what is underneath your ability to take the test. Everything that you call a hard skill, you need the soft skills to get it. And I was, we were talking earlier about how there's a lot of children being raised to adults and they're in a situation where they unemployable because of how they just don't have the basic ability to communicate the basic ability to quiet themselves in a moment of frustration and resist the urge to do something crazy or the basic ability to motivate themselves when they don't feel like going and getting up and doing what they need to do but because it has to be done, you just work. You just push through it. Just basic stuff like this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in our communities that are not being raised with that. And then what kind of future can a person have? Well, you can't even, you couldn't even work at McDonald's. Mm-hmm. That's not even like a, a, right. a life goal you know, right. for people to have. But at least if you can do that, you could uh, you could work up to bigger things. But if that's Absolutely. like, there's like such a gap between what what a person needs just to be able to function in a society and I, and I see it uh, so much that kind of by design we not really able to function together yeah because we're always thinking about me 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 yeah and yeah. not thinking about the we you know the we that it's the we that makes me that makes me me mm-hmm. and I can't advance myself and then call myself advancing myself and other people are left behind Mm -hmm. so there has to be a collective aspect of responsibility how do I fit into the bigger picture but then there's no bigger picture to even fit into Mm -hmm. nobody's presenting a bigger picture to these kids and it's just like well whatever and it's 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 a very layered problem, problem, but I think as, as we've been discussing this whole time, it's like culture is a, has to be the centerpiece. If not, then you, you're going to be take, if you don't have your own cultural values that you're standing on, then you're going to be adopting somebody else's, Absolutely. and probably somebody else that doesn't care about whatever happens to you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So on the cultural piece, I did want to ask, like. Out of your like faculty, do you guys have trips to Africa that you do, or like things like resources that you have in order to like enrich that? No, but we would love that. Okay. And if you have any connection to that, um, that would be perfect. I know originally in the beginning we were taking students to Ghana. 
Okay. Okay, so we were having trips. That venture is we are looking to go back to getting that getting those resources in place where there are free trips that we can take students and even staff. Mm. So that getting off the ground would just be for us major. Major. Okay. So looking into resources and if you all know I uh, resource we're able to do that because it's just a financial piece. I'm sure the commitment I'm would would be there. The interest is definitely there. Okay. Just them wanting to come to the school to embrace the culture, to actually get the opportunity to go, would be phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Well, even if they can't necessarily go, even just sometimes even giving that exposure in outside of the classroom setting, because mm-hmm. oftentimes you can't get it all in, and with the curriculum that you have to do because of the state then there's also a component that on the cultural enrichment side that perhaps can be done in an after-school program or something Mm -hmm. in addition to for those families who may be interested in in that we might not be able to sponsor children to to go to Africa but perhaps we can bring Africa (laughs) to to the schools um, from time to time if that's something we could probably talk about absolutely um, absolutely as far as enrichment is concerned absolutely yeah because there that's that's a piece of it that is just difficult to to bring in all of the cultural components surely what you're doing is a phenomenal job and like you said you're you're taking steps to get us to where we're trying to go and and we were even talking about like we all have to come together to like even just network on what ideas we can put in place what programs we can put in place to get all of us working together better on a collective basis as opposed to you guys doing this we're doing this Mm -hmm. how about we come together with those resources to continue to build the world that we're trying to that we want to see yeah, one of the, one of the things having been over there is I wanted to, I wanted to connect kids, young people from Africa, with kids over and young people over here. But the challenge in that is where we live is a French speaking country. Mm-hmm. So, but do you guys have a French program over there? No. Okay. No. So French is a major. We know. You obviously yeah. So we know. yeah. So because we sometimes we may get students from. Senegal or different places and they speak French so mm. we've had to figure that out how to develop a program where the students can still learn we have been able to figure that out but we have we don't have a French program where children are actually learning French because that, that would really open up doors for the children to to in some ways make connections in Africa as adults Oh, you, know, you. you you don't have to be limited just to the English speaking countries. There's also there's probably more French speaking countries than mm-hmm. English speaking countries. So it just opens more doors. And obviously speaking English will get you in some doors, but then right. it doesn't get you in every door. Right. Right. I will note that. Well, they could also learn they do, which is humanities and yeah. regional language yes. and um, the hieroglyphs would definitely be that can address so many issues on so many different levels in a sense that like the hieroglyphic language when we think about the English language with 26 letters 26 30 sounds or so mm-hmm. it's so very limiting where with the hieroglyphs just on the first level alone there's like 400 different sonograms so mm-hmm. that just in comparison to even the brain capacity is just monumentally contrasting mm-hmm. Yeah, and then it's a language that belongs to us. So there's there's that aspect. You don't have to be trapped in somebody else's language. And it, the significance to that is also there's a lot of concepts that's transmitted through the language that belong to a culture. Mm. So, for example, there's certain concepts, ideas that we don't really have words for in English. Yes. You have to try to like really explain it, what, yes. what you just could say in one word yes. in another language. Yes, now that is, that's another component that would be excellent. I did have the opportunity under to take a Metternich class under Jacob Carruthers, and I think his assistant name was Roosevelt at that particular time. It was, it was an outstanding course, but they were master teachers at the, you know. So, having that experience, it it is groundbreaking, and if that's something that our children could be exposed to. Mm-hmm. 
No, that that is yeah. That's a piece. That's Let's a strong talk. piece. We that's can a talk about piece. that. Yeah, we can talk yeah, about that. Yeah, we can talk about that. Well, I don't have anything else. I think this has been great, and I really appreciated your insights. And for us, it's just, it's inspiring to see a group of people come together and create a school that's Afrocentric and like based on African values, because we have our children that are growing up. We need to make sure that we, we're building institutions for our children, mm -hmm. and we need many institutions that are going to be supporting our our children and to see you guys holding down your part is it's phenomenal so keep it up and we're wishing you guys the best and for sure anything that we can do to try to supplement whether it be the faculty or the students or keep us in mind and we'll see, we'll see how we can collaborate we would love to that, that's really what this podcast is about Okay. Uh, it's built, It's about making these type of connections, having these type of conversations. And so us and our guests can network and build bridges, but also we can get out to the public, how the public can get involved and support things like that. So even if we're trying to do a trip to Africa, we we can crowdfund, we, we can find sponsors, we can find different people and it's out there in the public, in the public view. So we, we're honored once again to have you come out Take your time right, right before the school year begins. You have a daughter. She's mm -hmm. a superstar. We met recently. Yes. yes. It took me a second. I'm like, wait a minute. I appreciate this. We appreciate you. Yes, we appreciate sure. you and the entire Betty Shabazz community. It's been like one of these pillars in our community, whether you know it or not. Sometimes when you're in the trenches, you feel like you're in there by yourself, <laughs> but mm -hmm. do know that you have like your cheerleaders and, mm -hmm. and supporting staff and community members all around pushing forward. And again, we do want to bring those collaborative ideas and, and, and solutions to the problems that we all face. I appreciate it and I look forward to talking with you all some more. You too. All right, great. Well, I'm certainly honored. I'm not just buttering them up, but I'm really honored that we're having such a great guest for these first few episodes. Really looking forward to our next guest. I don't want to like spill the beans or anything, but we're looking forward to a certain high level administrator of a certain museum that we've been dealing with here in the city. So that's our next interview. Hopefully, I hope oh, okay. so. We look, we're working on it, but you know, last I heard she was out of town. If we okay. can get her, I'll be like, yeah, that'll be a great way to start. And then we also have one of the OGs of the Earth Center who's like, instrumental and kind of like helping Master Novel when he first got here. Uh -huh. And we're going to be trying to get him for around the New Year's. That'll so we, be wonderful. Yeah, we got an awesome lineup coming up and we're just going to keep bringing heavy hitters after heavy hitters and that's what, we, that's what we're about here right. on the sunny side, you know. We have so many opportunities to build bridges and building bridges is definitely more work, but it's rewarding. Ultimately, that's what's going to get us to our goal because individually our lives are so short we mm -hmm. can only do so much and then we whatever may happen we lose our strength we lose our energy we lose our drive we only can do so much individually but if we are passing the torch passing the inspiration spreading the knowledge and also receiving knowledge from other people who have been doing things that we want to be doing mm -hmm. we can do a lot more absolutely well, the education piece is so big. What did you think about the conversation in terms of education? Did you have anything else you wanted to bring up? Yeah, I, I wanted to bring up the discipline issue during the interview, but I just know that there's just so many limitations that we have in Chicago school system that discipline cannot be accurately addressed because we aren't in our own cultural setting. And the difference I was Look, talking about. Let's just call it what it is. You can't beat the kids, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm just say this. Whole... I was a substitute teacher uh -huh. for a, a window of time, and I found myself in the position that he was talking about. They had a group of children, a school that was about to be shut down because of discipline. Mm. So they threw all of the children who just misbehaved into one classroom. Whether they were in second, third, fourth, fifth grade, they all got tossed into like the cool out room or the naughty room or whatever you want to call it. That's the room that these children were in. And they hadn't had a school, a, a, a teacher for like six months. So every day they had a new substitute teacher. 
And so here I am, straight out of college, and I'm gonna be their substitute teacher. And I did this for a few hours, and the children were so just bad that I just, I, I was just at my wit's end. So I'm trying to be the nice person that I was raised to be, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't contain myself. It's like, anytime I would leave the classroom, anytime I would do something, the child, the classroom would just go up in, in to just pure chaos. So at one point I just got frustrated and I'm like, I'm taking you two to the principal's office. So I took two children down to the principal's office. They were like, don't give them to me, take them to the vice principal's office. I take them to the vice what? principal's <laughs> office. And they said, I don't want to deal with them. Take them to the, to the discipline room or something. Uh, I can't even remember the other place. I take them over there. They said, we don't want to deal with them. Take them to the library. Let's let the librarian deal with them. So I take them to the librarian and they saw that I was like so frustrated, like, what do you want me to do with these two children? So they just, out of compassion, they were just like, leave them here and just sit them over there. So I sat them over there and I went back to the classroom and when I tell you, the children were jumping on the tables, the chairs, throwing chairs, a chair like flew by somebody's head. And I, that was, in fact, that was the reason why I ended up taking the children to the principals. Anywho, one of the children, I'm like, okay, it's time to stop doing art. It's now trying to do math or whatever the case may be. And he just would not put his little colored pencils down. And I'm like, little Johnny, it's time to move on to the next thing. And he just wouldn't. He just flat out refused. And before I knew it, I had grabbed him by his collar and was like, I said, do this, this, and this, and this. And and he did it immediately. He just put his stuff away and it was finished. But at the same time, I'm like, this could be a lawsuit, fired, right? Yeah. This could be a lawsuit right here because I done just grabbed a little child that's not my own. Right. And so I just let his collar go one finger at a time. And I said, you know what? This is not worth me going to jail, getting into no fight, <laughs> getting into <laughs> losing my job and all this stuff. Right. So it's now about 2.30. Class school isn't over till 3.30. I went and got my purse, my bag and everything and I put it over my over my arm I went down to the principal's office I'm like you need to send someone to room 224 they're like oh but class isn't over till 3 30 it might be over for you at 3 30 but it's over for me right now I'm going home (laughs) (laughs) and then one of the ladies had the nerve to say I'm surprised you last this long and I was just fuming, but but that's the that's the environment that I was just like. But that child right then, all of the children, they needed a, just a straight up beat down, and they would have been in order, in line. Well, you would have been are, on some kung fu panda with a school of <laughs> thirty kids. I mean, a classroom of thirty kids. But and that's what I'm. The I'm they were time. all. They were all just just bad oh, and this was and I don't want to say not the children say they're bad. bad kids not bad children but yeah. their bad behavior is the, right. is the proper terminology mm-hmm. but negative behavior negative behavior yes. but that's the part that is just so difficult because when you're in a culture yeah. they just deal with stuff straight on they don't yeah. sugarcoat it they don't give you a timeout and all this and that if you need to be smacked the smack is coming yeah. it's just instantaneous it's over it's finished I saw a child yeah. once in the thing is like you don't you don't have to be smacked every time no just you know, raising your voice you just, or the give fact them a that you, a just the fact that you know that it can happen is already enough exactly exactly and I remember we were in the village setting and there was a child who was like maybe three or four years old and he didn't want to go somewhere where his mother was telling him to go he wanted to stay and eat bread and she was like it's time to go get showered up and ready for the day and he's just now throwing his back out and this that and the other and I, that was probably one of the first time I saw a little child throw their back out in Medita. And the mother didn't say anything, but everybody in the village was like, hey, hey, hey. From the grandmothers, the fathers, the aunties, everybody just corrected the child like instantly. And the mother literally didn't have to say another word. And he grabbed her hand and they walked back to where they needed to go to take his shower. And it was finished. Mm-hmm. But that was because everyone put their energy into just correcting it on the spot. But nowadays, like, you can't even talk to somebody's kid. Exactly. They'd be like, don't you talk to my baby. Exactly. You know, unless you, if, like, if you have to put your hand on somebody's child, that's a, that's a big problem. Well, that's why I didn't want to bring up the subject, because it's Well, like, no, it's not a bad subject to talk about. I mean, I'm sure he grew up a certain way like we did, and he'll probably recognize 
recognize that, but not to say that he's going to get any ideas and like start pulling, <laughs> start pulling switches on his way back to the school. I don't, I don't think he's going to do that. Exactly, but that's the that's the difficult part that we find ourselves in when you are in the colonial system. They have you in a box that you have to like abide by their their rules and to a certain degree. But listen, I was I had to take a mandated reporter class. Mm -hmm. What is that? It's for like certain positions you might have to do dealing with kids, mm -hmm. children, where you have to know in what situation you would have to report certain things to the authorities. Mm -hmm. And I was required to go through this program for some, some teaching job I was doing. But they said that if, a, if children are getting spanked by their parents, that's not grounds to call DCFS on mm -hmm. them. If you see signs of abuse like bruises and stuff like that that you know that's one thing mm -hmm. but if the person says if the if the kid tells you oh he'll get a whooping if you if you send him if you send him home with a note mm -hmm. that that's not grounds for reporting like mm -hmm. that you're not you're not gonna be legally what that means is like if you witness something and you don't say anything you also can be in trouble mm -hmm. that's what a mandated reporter is okay. mandated to report Otherwise, you you an accomplice. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole thing of in itself. But so I'm just you saying, saw me grab that child's collar. Would you have to report me? According to that, <laughs> it's been a minute since I took that. But, that uh, was kind of like a joke. Yeah, I, yeah, I probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have reported you. All right. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, we it, it was a great a great next episode, and I think that's all we have for you guys, our esteemed viewers. And please make sure. If you haven't already, hit the like button, subscribe, share this video, or if you're listening on audio, share it, share it with other people who you think would be interested in what we have to say, what we're talking about, so that we can continue to spread this message. Absolutely. So we're off to this African Fest Gala, and uh, we'll be seeing you next week. Next week. Peace and blessings on the sunny side. Life can be so sweet on the sunny side of the street.